I am in a strange place. Not to you, but to me. I'm a deep generation Texan. I've preached in many states, but never in Michigan until the last few days. And I will just say I've been very impressed with the people that I've met, the congregation here, and it does my heart good to know there are good brethren in this part of the world. And certainly if you're in Texas, hopefully you will come and see us at the BCS Church of Christ in College Station. State BCS stands for Bryan College Station, two towns that are joined together. I also want to say before I begin my preaching that uh, do not misunderstand the things I say. I have love in my heart toward all men. I have no animosity or ill will toward any man. I love people, even those who disagree with me. I consider myself to be a um, patriot, a good American, a person who loves people in this country. I feel thankful and blessed to have the freedoms that I have. I know you feel the same way. I know how to preach positive sermons. I have many sermons that I've preached on heaven and on kindness and goodness and love and many things. But tonight I'm going to say some things that might be hard to hear. But if a man's a gospel preacher, he has to preach the whole counsel of God. Any man who does not preach the whole counsel of God might be a preacher, but he's not God's preacher. Right. We need to preach all that the Bible would have us to preach. Now I want you to understand, I'm 49 years of age. I'm not old, I'm not young, I guess I'm in between. George Washington, they said, on one occasion his generals were fighting and bickering and about to um, come apart at the seams. The war was really progressing at that point. It seemed like they may could win, but I don't know. And he entered that area with all of those particular leaders and generals and colonels. And they saw him do something that was the first thing they had, time he had seen him do that. And he reached into his coat pocket and he pulled out a pair of spectacles like I have here. I, and he said that my eyes have grown dim and I've grown weary in the defense of my country. I've been preaching the gospel for 30 years. I started at 19. I'm 49. I don't know everything. I still have a lot to learn. I don't claim to know everything. But friends, I know a man can know what the Bible teaches. The Bible says of Jesus that the common people heard him gladly. If you turn to Jer Jeremiah chapter 36, and as you're turning there, actually just go to Jeremiah 20. I think that'll work as a springboard to, to chapter 36. I want you to also understand this. You don't know me. I grew up in a small town. I, I told you I grew up in a town of 600 people working on a ranch, a country boy, if you will. And I know that when I was 14 or 15 years of age, there's a man that moved into that little community that was a gospel preacher. Before that, we didn't have a gospel preacher. We had a man who gave lessons. And so we didn't know much. And he changed my life as he would preach the Bible and go into the Bible and make us turn and look up the text. And I can remember that 14, 15-year-old boy who didn't know his left from his right and I'm thankful that a man like Brother Baker would do what he did to preach the Bible so I could begin to learn and force me to get into the Scriptures. Jeremiah chapter 20, if you're a preacher, I know you probably feel this way sometimes, an elder, a faithful member, man or woman. Jeremiah 20 and verse number 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but... But his word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. The key is in verse 11, but the Lord is with me. We need to understand when we do what God would have us to do, God's with us. And when we don't do what God would have us to do, God is not with us. The person said, you know, God plus me makes a majority. I got news for you, friends. That's not right. God makes the majority whether you're with him or not. Now, you ought to be with him. Certainly, you should. Jeremiah chapter 36. That's our text tonight. We're going to go through this chapter and draw application and lessons on Jehoiakim's penknife. Jeremiah chapter 36. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and following. Romans 15, 4. We find the things written aforetime were written for our learning. So let us learn Jeremiah chapter 36, beginning in verse number 1. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. You ought to put a check mark right there. Josiah was a righteous king, a godly man, but that didn't mean his boys would be that way. When you study the kings, you will read about righteous men who had wicked sons and daughters, and you will read about wicked men who had righteous sons and daughters. And so at the end of the day, it is an individual decision. And it says here, he's the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, that the word came into Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words. Notice that. Words 
written in a book. We're talking about Scripture. Verse 3, It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. I want you to understand something tonight, my friends. God has two wills. He has his ideal will and he has his ultimate will. God's ideal will is this. All men everywhere would be saved. 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 4 says that God would have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3 and verse number 9. His uh, love and kindness is not slack but rather he wants all men to come to repentance. That's what God's ideal will is. But his ultimate will is this. Those who obey him will be saved and those who don't obey him will be lost. That's Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Few there be that find it as opposed to many there be which go in there at, that is to the broad way as opposed to the narrow way. God's ideal will is not going to happen, but his ultimate will will happen. And so you have a choice to make even this very night. We continue on in Jeremiah 36 and verse number 4. Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord. You may want to reference that to Jeremiah 1 9, where there we find that God gave the words to Jeremiah. And so you're seeing here the idea of inspiration, revelation. God gives it to man. Inspiration. These men would write down what God would have them to write down. That is God's word delivered in the form of words, written so we can read and understand. Verse number. Five says Jeremiah was in prison. You can cross-reference that with 33.1 that said he was in prison. Chapter 36 and 6. Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord. Notice those, those terms. Read, written, words. Words of the Lord. That goes back again to what we saw in verse 2. A book, write all the words. You may even notice and, and go over a little bit further. You're going to see in verse 18, the last sentence, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Chapter 36, verse 11, the last sentence of that verse. Heard out of the book all the words of the Lord. Where are these words going to be read later on? The end of verse 13. They're going to be read... The, he's going to read the book in the ears of all the people. Verse 16, we're going to find some are going to be afraid of those words. And another in verse 23 and verse 24 is not going to be afraid of those words. Here's what I want you to understand. I'm going to say this. Your approach tonight and every person, that, person in this whole world, their approach every day is simply this. Either they believe the Bible's the word of God or they do not. And if they believe the Bible is the word of God... They're going to follow it unless they don't know the truth or they are deceived. And so we have people who don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. We have others who believe it is the Word of God, but they're deceived and don't know the truth. And others who simply know it's the Word of God, they are not deceived, and they are able to follow the Scriptures. I want you to understand, if we are not able to read the words that are written and understand what is written, then God was not capable of getting us His Word. I deny that to the death. God was able to get us His Word just as He got the Word to the people of that day through Jeremiah, through Baruch. He wrote these words down in a book. The people could read. The people could understand. Some read and were afraid. Others read and were not afraid. Where are you at tonight, my friends? When you hear the Word of God preached and taught, do you believe it's the Word of God? If you don't, I would simply say you haven't studied enough of the Bible because you can study external or internal evidence, and the Bible is easy to prove. So many prophecies, so much scientific foreknowledge. Uh, you have the uh, idea of um, uh, geographic perfection, anticipation of error. We're going to get into some of that a little bit later, the anticipation of error. And how God, through His Word, has refuted every false doctrine that has been taught or will be taught even hundreds or thousands of years before it ever be given because God knew what man would teach years into the future. The Bible is so easy to prove if you study some of this material. How is it that, that Moses knew that a baby had to be circumcised not on the sixth day, not on the ninth day or the seventh day, but on the eighth day? Which, by the way, we now know from science is the exact day when prothrombin and vitamin K happens within the natural blood clotting of a baby. And therefore, that little male child was circumcised on the exact perfect day, the eighth day. And we've proven that from science to be the perfect day unless a, a shot is given to that child like we do in modern times. There is no way Moses could have guessed at that. 
Isaiah would say that the earth was round or circular, if you will, if you get into the Hebrew words. Job would say that it hung on nothing. We know that now from telescopes. And so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of proofs of the Bible, but friends, it's there. There is no other book like the Bible. The other books that claim to be from God, there's only a handful, are easily disproved. Many of them will uphold the Bible and then contradict the Bible. Therefore, they're out. Others will contradict themselves and or they will contradict that which is readily known. I'll just take the Quran, for example. Do you know that the Quran denies that Jesus died on the cross? Friends, even atheists that are honest don't deny that. They may deny that he came forth from the tomb because they haven't studied the evidence, but they don't deny that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And so the Quran, you can throw that out just like that. Here's what I'm trying to say. We cannot do what we're going to see this king does and cut the scriptures apart. Let's keep reading and get the context so we can get into some application and some preaching. I'm just, I'm just warming up. Jeremiah 36, and uh, go, if you will, down to uh, verse number 11. When Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, had heard out of the book all the words of the Lord, and then he lists all these princes in verse 12. They're called princes twice. Verse 13. Then Micaiah, uh, Micaiah declared unto them all the words that he had heard when Baruch read the book in the ears of the people. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudiah, Jehudiah the son of Nethaniah, uh, uh, unto Baruch. Skip down to verse 16. Now it came to pass when they heard all the words, they were afraid. Both one and the other and said unto Baruch, We will surely tell the king of all these words. Verse 18. Then Baruch answered them, and he pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Verse 20, they go to the king, but before they do, they hide the scriptures in the chamber of Elisha with the scribe. Verse 21, so the king sent Je Jehudah to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elisha with the scribe's chamber. And Je Jehudah read it in the ears of the king. Now, this is going to be dealing with certain things and how long captivity would take place and all that. But notice, he reads God's word to the king. Verse 22, now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudiah had read the uh, three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife. Now that was a knife they whittled on these little writing instruments with. We'd just say a knife. And then he threw it, cast it into the fire. This is scripture. That was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid. Verse 16, see some of these other people had been afraid, but now the king and those right around him, they were not afraid. Verse 25, he lists a few names. And then he says that, that one, one man tried to stand up and say, look, don't, don't burn it, uh, but he would not hear. Verse 25. Verse 26 then says the end of the verse that, Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah were to hide. God was going to hide them. Verse number 26, he had told them to hide in verse 20 and then, or 2019. And then verse 26, God hides them. Verse 28, what happens? God says, take thee again another roll and write it in the former words. There were in the first roll when Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned it. And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, thus saith the Lord. Thou hast burned this roll, saying, why hast thou written therein, saying the king of Babylon should certainly come? And then it goes on down. He says, I'm going to punish you just like I said. And, but he wouldn't hearken. Verse 31, the last sentence. Go to verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire. I love this last part. And there were added besides unto them many like words. So he got two sermons because he, he burned that one and cut it up. Now, there are great lessons tonight from this chapter. What are some of these lessons? I've just got two points, generically and specifically. Here's what I mean. Generically speaking, and I get specific even in generic, but uh, the, generically speaking, I want you to think about this. Have people not taken the Bible, and maybe not physically, though some have done it physically, but certainly figuratively or mentally, have they not taken and cut the Word of God up, burn the Word of God in their mind, if nothing else, maybe on a fireplace or cut it with a knife. But they've certainly done that. You say, Jason, where have people done that? Well, friends, even religious people have done that in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
And if you go on down, he'll say things like he created uh, various things. And it was the first day and the morning and the evening were the first day. And then it'll list some more things of the second day, the third day, the fourth day. Six days he then ceased from creation or rested, if you will, on the seventh day. How could you read Genesis 1 and 2 and not understand exactly what God means? Do you read about evolution in there? Do you read about um, theistic evolution in there? What is theistic evolution, Jason? That's people who try to say, well, God did it, but he did it through evolution. Friends, that's a lie. I know that's a lie because Jesus in Matthew 19 quotes from the book of Genesis, let's just say regarding man and woman, he quotes Genesis 1 where the Bible says in verse 26 and 27 that God created a man in his own image, male and female created he them. Jesus quotes that in Mark 10 and in Matthew 19 and he says this, he says from the beginning created he them, male and female. Evolution teaches man came along millions of years later. But Jesus said, no, man and woman were made from the very beginning on the sixth day. And that is not eons or epics of time. That is false doctrine. Not only that, it would make Paul a liar in Corinthians where he refers to Adam being the first man. And of course, he references there Jesus being likened unto him. What about the flood? Well, Peter calls that an, a real event because in 1 Peter 3, he talks about the flood and how water separated them, just like baptism separates us from the world today. He's called a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2, 5. The book of Romans, also Adam is mentioned there. And so the point is, Jonah, Jesus, you talk about another thing they deny. They say, well, Jonah wasn't really swallowed by a great fish. Well, Jesus didn't know that apparently because Jesus referenced Jonah being in the belly of that fish just like he would be in the belly of the earth. And so therefore, if you deny that event, you might as well deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here's what I'm trying to say. You can get fancy, believe evolution if you want to, but the Bible is very clear. And you could not read Genesis 1 through 11 and not understand it's literal, it's historical, it is written in that way. It is not a figurative context. Not at all. But people today have cut it up, thrown it away, because they want to simply believe what some fellow believed in the 1850s, who was a racist, by the way. If you actually study the full title of Darwin's work on the origin of the species, you would come up away appalled at what that man was and what he was trying to prove. And yet people think that's what you have to believe. No, I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. I believe the world's around 6,000 years old based on the chronological uh, datings of the Bible. And uh, anybody who denies that can fight with God and with Moses and with Jesus and with Peter and with Paul. What about um, the fact that even one word could be changed in Scripture? Genesis chapter 3, isn't that what Satan did? They knew what God said to do. Satan confronted them there in Genesis 3, and he said, Has God said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And Eve said, well, we can eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we cannot eat of it lest we die. And Satan, right after that, says, thou shalt, watch it now, thou shalt not. That's one little bitty word, three letters. Thou shalt not surely die. You keep that in mind later when I get to 1 Peter. Thou shalt not, one word. One word can be twisted. And yet inspiration can even hang on one letter. In Galatians chapter 3, it talks about the seed line coming through Isaac. And it says of Jesus that, that he was, that we're saved as, uh, he didn't say seeds as of many, I'm quoting Galatians 3, but seed, which is one, which is the seed which come from Abraham, that is through Isaac. That's the idea of, of Galatians chapter 3. So even one letter can determine if the Bible is inspired or not inspired. Let me go a little bit deeper. Genesis chapter 6. You don't have to get far into the Bible to understand the authority principle. Genesis chapter 6, in verse number 14, here's how clear it is. God said to Noah, Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Now, that's not the Ark of the Covenant later on. This is the great big boat, okay? They built a replica of it, of it up there in Kentucky, and I've been there, and I'm going to tell you that is one big boat. Not to mention, if you study the species, there were not as many species back then. And so he didn't take every variety of dog. He didn't have to do that to get them on the ark. He could take a male dog, a female dog. You get into the different sets that were there to do what he did. They proved that with some of the things they've done in Kentucky, even if you, if you want to just look at the evidence. But here's what I'm trying to show you. The patriarchal time period, that's the time of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Noah, etc. Then you have the law of Moses, the law of Christianity, three dispensations. 
But here's what you want to, what I want you to understand. In Genesis 6, what did God say to Noah? He said, Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. You know what verse 22 says? It says, all that God commanded him, so did he. So God commanded it, he was able to understand it, and he was able to obey it. That's Genesis chapter 6. Well, Jason, what does it mean, make an ark of gopher wood? I'll tell you what it means. It means make an ark of gopher wood. We live by what the Bible says. Now, I know we're not under that dispensation. Don't miss my point. But the principle is the same in patriarch law, Moses, and Christianity. That is, when God says what he says, he means what he says. If God, if Noah didn't have to make the ark of gopher wood, so he could have used some other kind of wood, because after all, God didn't say not to. You know where I'm going with this. God didn't say not to, therefore he could have used some other type of wood. You know what that means? That means that God wasted his breath saying make it out of gopher wood because make it out of gopher wood really didn't mean make it out of gopher wood. That's nonsense. We know make it out of gopher wood means make it out of gopher wood. Now, people will get all kind of mixed up. We'll get on instrumental music, mechanical instrumental music later on. And they'll say, well, um, you know, if you have a songbook, that's the same thing as a piano. Hold on a minute. Let's go back to Noah's Ark. When Noah said make an ark of gopher wood, could Noah have gotten those trees from grove A, grove B, grove C? Well, certainly, because God did not specify that. He simply specified the wood. Could Noah have used saws and hammers and pulleys and oxen? Of course he could, because those were aids to building it out of gopher wood. Those were not additions, a.k.a. another kind of wood. So when God later on in the New Testament will say sing, he specified the type of music he wants. Can we use a songbook or sheet music? Certainly we can. Can a person use a pitch pipe and then, and then put it in his pocket and leave the singing? Certainly he can because those are simply aids. They are not an addition. A mechanical instrument of music is a whole different form and type of music. I can understand that in Genesis 6. Make the ark of gopher wood. We need to understand generic authority, specific authority. We need to understand how the Bible authorizes. And so even approaching the Bible, generically speaking, Jeremiah 36 teaches me something. Here's what I'm trying to tell you tonight. The Bible is a pattern. Jason, how do you know that? Because I've read Exodus 25. In Exodus 25, verse 9, as well as in Exodus 25, verse 40, the Bible referring to the tabernacle, now we're under the law of Moses dispensation, he says there that all that furniture had to be made according to the pattern. To the pattern showed him in the mount. It's quoted, by the way, and referenced in the New Testament two times in the book of Hebrews, showing that we also are under a pattern, though not the law of Moses, but the law of Christ, which is a better covenant. And so we can understand those things. Let me just make it a little bit more clear. Leviticus chapter 10. Turn there because you're looking at me kind of funny. As Brother Bonner would say, I heard somebody here was a friend of his, and so he's a friend of mine, and I'll quote, quote Bonner there. He said, you're looking at me kind of funny. You know, Brother Bonner said one time, and lovely, I'll tell on him tonight if you don't know him. And uh, Brother Bonner's a good friend of mine, black gospel preacher. And I laughed so hard like to fill out of the pew some years ago in uh, Love Lady, Texas. He was preaching there. Had on an orange suit. I guess I got on a crazy blue one tonight. But he had on this orange suit. He got up, started his sermon about like this. Got up there, put his Bible all out. He looked over the audience. He said, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that's one good looking black man. Get your Bible out. <laughs> He's crazy. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. And now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense their own. Notice this, King James, and offered strange fire. Some versions say unauthorized fire. In other words, they were to get the fire from one source, but they got the fire to light the incense from a different source God had not commanded. Therefore, they went outside of what God commanded. They, they used silence, but silence forbids. Implication binds, but silence forbids. And they just took it upon themselves to do whatever they wanted to do. Well, the verse, verse number um, two says, and God said that's not a big deal because patterns don't matter after all as long as you feel good. That is not what I'm not reading the Bible. I'm reading something, but it ain't the Bible. Verse 2 says, And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. 
If you study the rest of the chapter, God tells their own father, Aaron, He says, don't you even cry for these boys. They have not sanctified me and done what I commanded them to do. That's Leviticus 10, 1 and following. That kind of language is all throughout the Bible. Again, Exodus 25. You also could go to 2 Samuel 6, Uzzah, one of the most famous Old Testament stories you'll ever see regarding this. 2 Samuel 6, also 1 Chronicles 13. And Uzzah, we all know the story maybe, he reached up and steadied the Ark of the Covenant. Not Noah's Ark, but the Ark of the Covenant. Now that chest that had the Law of Moses in it and the, and the um, mercy seat on top of that. He touched the Ark of the Covenant. Number one, it was supposed to be carried on poles, not on a wagon. That's a big no-no. Number two, you're not supposed to touch it. How do you know that? Numbers chapter 4, I believe about verse 15. God had said, I think about 400 years earlier, don't touch it. If you do, you're going to die. My study from 2 Samuel 6, 1 Corinthians 13, is that I believe he did it out of sincerity. It doesn't seem he was being malicious because the oxen stumbled and it was about to fall off the wagon and he in an instant just reached up to try to steady it and boom, God struck him dead. Just like in Leviticus chapter 10. You know, someone in Genesis chapter 6, I used to, I was preaching one time decades ago, younger preacher, and I remember preaching. I said, let me tell you something. If Noah had not built Noah's ark, if he had not built that ark out of gopher wood, it would have sunk like a rock. Hold on now on that amen. Old preacher caught me afterwards. He said, hey, I want to tell you what an old sister told me. Now, that's probably going back because he was pretty old back then. I don't know, maybe 100 years. You put all the ages together. He said an older sister caught me one time, and I said the same thing you did. And I knew what I meant because that's why I would have amended it too, whoever they amended. But, but he said, he said that sister had it right. He said, she said, had he not made it out of gopher wood, it would have never even floated. That's it. That's exactly right. Because you have to do what God says when God says to do something a certain way. But what if he gives you, if it's a generic command? Well, then you have some wiggle room. If it's specific, you don't have as much wiggle room. We need to understand these things. What about, what about us again? Well, I believe 1 Chronicles um, chapter 13, verse 15 kind of nails it. 1 Chronicles 13, 15, what does that say, Jason? It says that they had not sought God after the due order. That's the same thing as Exodus 25, the pattern, or make it out of gopher wood. I know I'm mixing stories here, but I'm using the same concepts, which is what? Pattern, pattern, pattern. The Bible is a map. The Bible is a standard. The Bible is a pattern. The Bible is a guide. You know what the liberal mind says? Well, I, I don't know about all that. You know, we're not, we don't really, we're not, we're not, we don't keep the rules. It's really more about the way I feel in my heart. Friends, that is absolutely not what the scriptures teach. You should have a sincere heart. And if you don't have a sincere heart, guess what? You're wrong. Because the Bible also teaches you to have a sincere heart. I can just quote one scripture. Romans 6, 16 and following. It says that they have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Delivered unto them, being then made free from sin, they became the servants of righteousness. So you have the heart and the form of doctrine. You have the attitude, the sincerity, and you have the pattern. If a man teaches pattern only, no matter what your attitude is, he's teaching false doctrine. If a man teaches that you can have a good, sincere attitude, no matter what the pattern says, he's also teaching false doctrine. I want to do away with forever with this idea of sincerity only. Here it is. Jacob and Joseph. When you study about the life of Jacob and Joseph, Joseph was supposedly dead. Jacob thought he was dead. Jacob reacted just like Joseph was dead. But friends, Joseph was not dead. He had been thrown into a pit by his brothers. His brothers deceived the father with that, that blood of the goat on that, uh, on that particular, on his coat of many colors. And the father acted just like it was real. You know why? He was basing it on the wrong information. You know why there are people today that are sincere? Because they're basing what they believe on the wrong information. They're basing what they believe not on what the Bible teaches, but what, on what they think the Bible teaches. There are many sincere religious people, and a lot of them are my friends and your friends. I'm not knocking their sincerity at all. Do not say I'm, 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 I'm downing their I'm not saying that. But I'm simply saying it's not sincerity alone. Let me make it real practical. If you think it's sincerity alone, you listen to this illustration. Have you ever been eating uh, maybe a, a sandwich of some sort? with a friend, and that friend has a little bit of mustard on their, on their lip. I can tell you if you really love them, you tell them or, or don't tell them. If you don't tell them, 
you probably, you probably got to check yourself. You're a little bit liberal. If you tell them, <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. If you tell them, it's because you're trying to help them. And they say, I, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Do you want them walking into public with mustard on their lip? Or do you want them to tell them, look, hey, you got a little mustard on your lip. I'm not saying you have to be harsh about it or slap the mustard off their I'm not saying that. But you can tell, hey, you got mustard on your lip. We've all done that. Sincerity does not make you right. Sincerity matters, but it's sincerity and truth. I think that's common sense. Don't we think that's common sense? Now, I could just keep on going. But I want to in the last little bit I have to get a little more specific. That's generic. Let's get specific. Atheist. Atheist. Psalm 14.1. What do they do? Jeremiah 36. They cut Psalm 14.1 out of their Bible. What does it say? The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Someone says to a person, you're a fool. You don't believe there's a God? You're a fool. Well, you shouldn't say that to them. What do you mean? That's God said it. Psalm 14.1. Uh, Psalm 53.1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Why is he a fool? Because Psalm 19 says even the heavens declare the glory of God. If a man could look up into the sky and understand cause and effect in the clouds and the, and the stars and the sun, how in, the, how in anyone's right mind could they come to the uh, conclusion that that just happened, that that was just an accident, that from nothing came something? That doesn't make any sense. You either have eternal matter or you have eternal mind, which is God. We know it's not matter because scientific laws show that that runs down in the law of entropy. And you can get into the first, second law of thermodynamics. It's easy to prove it's not matter. Therefore, it has to be mind or God. God is eternal. It's the only thing that can explain why we're here, why this universe exists. Just a study of the human body. Why is it that we don't have a congregation tonight across the street of uh, you know, dogs or cats that are assembled together and they're, and they're praising uh, some greater being? It's because they're animals. They're animals. I want to, I, I, listen, the, the Bible covers so many topics. The Bible says that a good man is not cruel to his beasts. I'm not saying that. And there are people who are evil to animals. That's, that's, that's not what they should be doing. On the other hand, we live in a world now where people treat their animals better than they do people. Right. They do. I'm telling you right now, I think there's people that would shoot you before they would let something happen to one of their dogs or cats, even though realistically you could eat one of them if you wanted to. I'd rather eat a pig myself or a cow. But uh, you look, false religion comes into play. What do you mean, Jason? You know how many people are starving over in, in India and other places because they won't eat the cows? They worship the cows instead of eating the cows? And yet the Bible says of a brute beast, he's quoting about a false teacher, but he makes the principal application, a brute beast is made to be destroyed. And so certainly we can eat an animal. Animals are not people. And so it comes so far now where you have some people, I heard a lady in a Bible class, even in the Lord's church, on, on a tape a couple of years ago, and she said, uh, brother so-and-so, you know, my little dog, uh, I can't remember, just, I'll make up the name, Trixie. And, and if, if she dies, you think, you think little Trixie will be in heaven? The preacher said, well, you know, I don't really know. I don't, I'm not sure of the Bible. No, Trixie's not going to be in heaven. When a dog is dead, they're dead. A dog does not have a spirit as a man has a spirit. We are a triune being in a soul, spirit, and body. Soul can be used to, to refer to the person or to the spirit itself, depending on the context. But the point is an animal has animation, an animal has a body, but an animal does not have a soul slash spirit as in an inward man or something that goes to be with God for eternity. The Bible makes that clear. And yet some people just take and cut that right out of their scriptures and burn it. You know why? Because I just love little Trixie. I'm serious. Let's get a little more specific. Humanist. What do you mean humanist, Jason? This creeps into the church too. A humanist is someone who wants to do what they want to do. Let me quote a scripture. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Seems right. They're trying to base their truth on what they believe. Have you ever heard this? That's your truth. But that's not my truth. Or how about this? Let's just agree to disagree. I'm not speaking about opinion. I mean doctrine, truth, which is laid out in the Scripture. Let's just agree to disagree. What they're really saying is there's not really any truth. We can't really know it. And so you do you and I'll do me. That is humanism. And uh, you, you go into the study of German rationalism. What is that, Jason? Well, in the 1800s and even before that, you had these people that began to study in college. and They began to deny the Scriptures. And they came out with the... Uh, the idea that Moses really didn't write the Pentateuch, and so they have all these redactors that supposedly wrote it. 
Well, that would make Jesus a liar again because he in the book of John and many other places would quote and say, as Moses had said or has written, and he would quote from the Pentateuch. So if you're going to say that uh, the Moses didn't write the first five books of the Bible, then just go ahead and call Jesus a liar. That's what you've got to deal with. And so you have German rationalism. It then worked its way in until later on you had modernism. Modernism is the idea of, well, there may be some sort of truth, but it's not in the Bible. It worked its way to the 70s, 1970s, so for 50 years now, we've, we've lived in a postmodern society. Postmodernism is there is no truth at all. Truth does not exist. And so you have postmodernism. You can even study deconstructionism. You want to know what's going on now with the critical race theory and the DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. I didn't say equality. That's a different word. Equity and inclusion. You know, study that stuff. All they're doing is quoting from Karl Marx. I've read a lot from the man. I know what I'm talking about. They're, they're reading from these Marxist, communist, atheist scholars, and they're implementing it into religion, and people don't know what to do with it because they haven't seen it in 50 or 60 years. Friends, we need to wake up to what's going on in this country, but also certainly in the Word of God. That's what's happening. The Bible covers all these things. Critical race theory is simply one element of it. You have critical gender theory. It all goes back to critical theory, which comes from Herbert Marcuse and the Frankfurt School, which they all came from Germany during World War II. You can go to Columbia University right now, and you can learn how to be a man even though you're a woman. That's exactly what's happening. Jason, what's that deconstruction stuff you mentioned? Deconstructionism is this. You can't really understand another person because they have a background and a construct and so you have to deconstruct their language and try to remove their background to be able to understand them. Here's the problem. All these so-called scholars, Abraham X. Kennedy and all these other crazy people and the 1619 Project and all, they also have a background. So how is it that you don't have a background but I have a background? So you have to deconstruct my language but I don't have to deconstruct your language? Friends, here's the point. What they're really saying is there's no truth but my truth and I'll tell you what truth is. That is not what the Bible teaches. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right in a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. The only way I know what truth is is what the Word of God says. Is racism a sin? Yes. James chapter 2 makes it very clear. If a man is quote-unquote white, whatever that means, and he thinks a person that's black is not his equal, he's sinning. If a man that's black thinks a person who's white is not his equal, he's sinning. We're all made in the image of God. After all, what color is a soul? But when you deal with people who are not knowledgeable of the Word of God, They've cut it out, they've burned it, they've changed it, and you end up with all kind of stuff. You have many religious people, before I go to my next point very quickly, and the good thing is that the clock has a glare on it, which helps me, but it doesn't help you, but I see it. But um, the point is, there, I just there's so many other things that we could, we could deal with and all that. Uh, here's what I was going to say. They'll go to Acts 2. They'll say, you know, God says they had all things in common. And so we're to share all things in common with each other. And so therefore, really, Jesus was a socialist or a communist. Acts 2 has a context, number one. Number two, Acts 2 does not contradict Acts 5. Because in Acts 5, 3 and 4, when Ananias and Sapphira uh, sold the land and then lied about it, God said, when it was your land, was it not your own? And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Could you not do with it what you wanted to because it was yours? Showing there is such a thing as ownership. Even in the Old Testament, it says, Thou shalt not cover, covet thy neighbor's house. That means it's his house. He owns something. And so ownership and the idea of the free market economy is taught in the patriarchal law of Moses and the law of Christianity. I will challenge anyone on that effect. There's many other scriptures we could go to. And yet people will twist things out of Acts 2 and other places. That's not being just with the scriptures. Not being just. Go a little bit further, Jason. What about worldliness? Worldliness. I'm going to tell you, man, pe people have gone crazy. I mean, it's to the point now, you have people even in the church sometimes, sadly, not all, thankfully, that will justify things that are clearly condemned in the Scriptures. Drinking. Social drinking. Alcohol. I'm talking about drinking alcohol. And so... The idea they'll say, well, you know, I mean, after all, it says there that an elder can't drink, but a deacon, he can drink a little bit. And an old woman, she can drink a little bit, Titus chapter 2, because it says not given to much wine. Here's people, we, we've got to think. 
If that's what that means, then what do we do over there in Ecclesiastes when he says that a person should not be over much wicked? Does that mean they can be a little wicked? That would be the logical idea. Does it mean in James 1 where he says, lay apart all, super, of, all superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word? Does that mean we don't have, we, 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 can, uh, lay, we have to lay apart the overabundance of wickedness, but we, we can still keep a little bit of wickedness? Again, that would be the logical import of that mindset. What is he saying then when he says not given to much wine? He's simply saying don't be a drunkard. He's condemning the excess or the, or the end of the thing, but that doesn't mean that he's limiting the idea that a person can do a little bit of it. He's not saying that. I know that's the case because there's a Greek word nepho, and it means sober. Some lexicons would say free from that which will intoxicate, free from intoxicants, that which will cloud the mind. You also have methusko, another Greek word. Don't begin to be softened. Galatians 5, drunkenness, watch this, and the such like. First of all, what's drunkenness? I'll say this, drunkenness is, begins with, it's a process. It begins with the first drink. When you take one drink, you're one drink drunk. Amen. What is drunkenness? Well, drunkenness, you define it then. Well, it, it's, it's uh, see, they can't define it. But however you define it, he still says, and the such like is a work of the flesh. And yet we're going to say, well, that's okay for a person to go pop a Budweiser and, and drink a little bit of alcohol with their spaghetti. Let me just say this. If you drink alcohol for social and pleasurable purposes, you sin. The Bible is clear about that. And yet you have people that sometimes even come in and justify that, and, and uh, they're going to deal with God on that, on that thing. Um, we could go into, you know, um, gambling, dancing. So what do you mean gambling and dancing? Listen, remember that 14-year-old boy I was talking about? When that preacher walked in that congregation, I had a pair of little old shorts on. I had a, I had a Baptist t-shirt, Baylor University, because, I mean, that's his Baptist school. My dad had ran track there before he was a Christian. And I'm sitting in there. I had a big NIV version. I hadn't read the Bible. I don't have a clue. He comes in there, and he, through teaching and preaching, gets me into the book teaches me there's difference in versions. I'm not saying there's one version uh, as opposed to another as far as that you have to use a certain version. But friends, there are good versions and bad versions when you study it. And why would you want a version that gives a man's thought as opposed to a version that tries to get it as close as it can to the original? If you're thinking straight, you'll throw that NIV in the garbage. Get you a King James ASV 1901 or something that'll help you a little bit more toward the original. But the point is this, through his preaching and teaching, I, can I argued with him about dancing. I can remember that. You know why? I wanted to go to the prom. I wanted to go to the homecoming dance. And my parents would even argue with him at the time because we hadn't been taught. And then I began to study and I began to look into the scriptures. And he would take me to Galatians chapter 5 and Romans chapter 1. And I began to look up words like lasciviousness, evil concupiscence, uncleanness, revelings. Abominable uh, uh, bank, uh, idolatries, banquetings. Now, I'm not going to do it for lack of time, but I'm simply quoting some of the words from Romans 1, Galatians 5, Colossians 3, 2 Timothy 3. Just go read them. They're the lists of sins. Have you ever studied those words? I have. What does the word lasciviousness mean? Just one example. The word lascivious is the idea of, 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 of bodily movement, particularly one lexicon says, the unchaste handling of males and females, indecent bodily movements that excite lust. Does that not describe the modern dance? <laughs> it's a work of the flesh. And yet I know many a preacher like John the Baptist get his head cut off for preaching on this stuff. Well, you can't say that because my daughter, she wants to go to the prom. You can't say that because, because uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a superintendent of school and, and, and it's, it must be okay. Can I challenge you? Study history. A hundred years ago in this country, even denominational people were opposed to that stuff. Go, go look it up. Friends, we have got to stand for the truth. I don't even have time to get into biblical nakedness uh, or immodesty, if you will. People act like there's no line. If you've got your thighs showing and you're showing your bare back and your nakedness and wearing bathing suit, that is not what the Bible teaches. Someone says, Jace, you can't prove that. Listen. Genesis 3, 7, they put on loincloths. Genesis 3, 21, God made them aprons in the Hebrew, a garment that covers from the shoulders to the knee. You go to Isaiah, he calls the nakedness that which the thighs exposed. You can study this through all the principles of Scripture. Why would God say in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
Women, adorn yourselves in modest apparel if we can't know what modest apparel is. That would mean God has commanded an impossibility. And I don't believe that. And so people today, they push and they, they try to teach certain things. On the other hand, you talk about cutting Scripture up and burning it. Some of our Pentecostal friends go too far, and then they'll say, no, no, well, wear, one must wear a skirt on all occasions, or they can't cut their hair, or can't wear any makeup at all. And they'll go to 1 Peter 3 or 1 Timothy 2. But in 1 Peter 3, he uses the phrase, not the putting on of apparel. If taken totally literally, that means you couldn't wear clothes, which would contradict 1 Timothy 2. Which means there has to be some common sense in this thing. And so he's describing their women who would try to ornate themselves and they would be like that strutting peacock, if you will, had on so much makeup, take you 24 years to take it off. We have to use our minds, our brains. We have to think. Some, some that want to corrupt scriptures, they'll say things like, well, we, we don't really, we don't get into this implication stuff. You know, what the Bible implies. We can't, that's not really, we can't bind that. Be careful. Acts chapter 2, the Bible says explicitly be baptized and that they were baptized. It says it explicitly. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Acts 2.41, as many as received his word were baptized. That's explicit, so many words. But repentance, while commanded explicitly, is never in Acts 2, it never shows that they actually did it explicitly. I have to understand that they repented implicitly. So I infer what the Bible implies. Jason, how do you know they repented? Because you can't be baptized properly unless you first repent, even though it doesn't say it in so many words. You want to know why we have five acts of worship? Because we go to the Bible, read the whole New Testament, and we see that's exactly what they did. Had a fellow the other day said, you ever heard of this? Somebody's trying to bind foot washing as an act of worship. I said, well, that's interesting because even though there are examples of foot washing, there's never a command for foot washing to be observed. Therefore, when they use that example, that is not based on the commandment to foot washing. They're taken out of context. I said, as opposed to the Lord's Supper. In Luke 22 and other places, Jesus said, when I go into glory, I'm going to partake the Lord's Supper with you in the kingdom, which is in the church. And then we have an example in Acts 20, verse 7, of when they did it. It was on the first day of every week. Just like they were to keep the Sabbath holy. Keep the Sabbath holy. Does that mean everyone? Apparently they understood it, everyone, even though he just said keep the Sabbath holy. Therefore, here's an example of when they did it based on a command to do it, the Lord's Supper. And if I do what they did on the day they did it every first day of the week, I am what they were, which is simple New Testament Christians. You do not have to be a rocket scientist to understand the basics of New Testament Christianity. I'm out of time, and I didn't even get to half of what I want to say. That just means you're going to, have to come back. But since some of y'all came a long way, I need you about five more minutes and I'll offer the invitation, maybe, maybe seven. Just there you go. I like that. I don't know where you're from, but come to Texas. <laughs> Can I just say this? For Jeremiah 36, I've gone generic, I've gone specific, I've talked about atheists, humanists, worldly, worldly things. Can I just end by saying this? What about religion? Do, do people cut their scriptures up when it comes to religion? Let me just say this. Think about our Catholic friends. Remember what I said, I don't have ill will against anybody. What do are, what are people who are Catholics do with Matthew, with Matthew chapter 9, verse 23? Jesus said, call no man father on earth, for there is one which is your father in heaven. And that's a religious sense. Don't call a man father religiously. What do they call their quote-unquote priests? They call them father. They've taken Matthew 9, 23, and they've cut it out of their scriptures, even, even if it's just mentally. The Bible says all Christians are priests. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, verse 9, Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6. They, yet they call, their, they call their religious leaders priests. I didn't cover it last night, but in Ephesians chapter 1, about verse 10 or 11, it talks about an inheritance. ASV says heritage. That word, that Greek word, is where the word clergy comes from. And in the context there, he's saying all Christians are clergy. There is no clergy laity. It's simply Christians and non-Christians. And yet a whole system has been built on those false ideas because men, maybe, maybe meaning to do right, have taken and applied things that are the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. I mean, how hard is this? Jesus said, don't call a relig man religiously father. Uh, father so-and-so, can you do the wedding for my daughter and my son? That's a problem. They've taken, they've cut it out of their scriptures. We could go into many other doctrines that they teach. The idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Well, how could she be a perpetual virgin in light of John 7, 5 and Matthew 13, 55, where she clearly had more children? 
She didn't know Joseph until after Jesus was born, but after he was born, they conducted themselves as a husband and wife do and had more children. That's, and, and yet they teach the perpetual virginity of Mary. That's a, that's a false doctrine. They've cut those scriptures out of their Bible. What about our Lutherans? One of my best friends is a Lutheran. They sprinkle babies. The Bible teaches immersion of adults. Men and women were baptized, Acts 8, 12, and 13. Not little innocent children. Jesus said little children are innocent and will inherit the kingdom. We've got to become like a little child. You could go into, not to mention the name, I, would, I wouldn't want to be called a Lutheran. I'd want to be called a Christian. And then you have the Episcop Episcopals and the Methodists. Women's role. I knew a man one time years ago, he asked me if I'd met his wife who was the pastor at the local Methodist church. And I thought to myself, what does she do with 1 Timothy 2? I permit not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence. And so oh, that's a cultural thing. How can it be a cultural thing when he gives two examples? He goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. That is that Eve was deceived. And, and Adam was created first. And so he uses those as examples and takes it all the way back to the eternal principle, or not eternal, but the principle set forth in Genesis chapter 2, moving forward. An authority concept. 1 Corinthians 11 also, by the way, God, Christ, man, woman, God is setting up structure and authority in this world, and yet they just want to cut out 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 and following. I don't, I don't want to do that. Now you want to know how bad it's gotten? The Methodists have recently split. And there is, if you notice, you go to some of these Methodist churches. I know back, I saw one the other day, and it, it used to say United Methodist Church. And they had duct taped over United because there's two groups. You know what they split over? Homosexuality, LGBTQ2+, whatever. You have some of them that are conservative enough and right, by the way, on that when they say, that. Hey, you can't, that's not what the Bible teaches. It's a man and a woman. How beautiful is God? In Genesis chapter 1, from the beginning created he them, male and Female, that's it. Male and female. A person can mutilate themselves and call themselves something else, but that doesn't make them that thing. I mean, what if someone self-identifies as a giraffe? I mean, think about it. He starts eating grass, tries to stretch his neck out. You would say, well, that's silly. Well, how silly is it today when people do that? And then we live in a country, they're already doing it in Canada. I, I heard y'all's legislature tried to do it, where they're trying to say, if you misgender someone, we'll find you. We'll just line up and find a way. We'll put you in jail. Open the jail up. I'm not going to lie and go to hell, Revelation 21.8, because you're going to tell me to tell me that somebody's something they're not. I'm going to call them what they are, not what their deranged mind says that they think they are. Any more than I'd call a man a giraffe, he's sitting there talking, I'm a giraffe. No, you're not. You're a man. Friends, that's where it goes whether it's religion or out of religion, when people start unraveling the Word of God. Here we go. We've got, to, got to hurry it up. Baptist. A lot of family in the Baptist church. Love them. They're hard-headed. If they change 8, 9, 12 different things, they could come on. They'd be, they're so close in many ways and so far in others. Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. Either He did or He didn't. Either he told the truth or he lied. And if he did build his church, and there's one doctrine, 2 John verse 9, and anybody who doesn't abide in that doctrine does not have Christ, how hard is that to understand? 1 Corinthians 1.10 says we're to be one in mind and one in doctrine. And he's talking about, again, doctrine, not just opinion, not the color of the carpet. And so, you know, they say, well, it doesn't matter if you want to have a piano. Genesis 6, go for wood. It doesn't matter if you call yourself Baptist. Listen, and the act of immersion, the Baptist manual is really good on proving immersion. But then it turns around and says, but you don't have to be baptized to be saved. So you're saved without baptism that half their manual teaches it has to be immersion. Why does it have to be immersion if I don't even have to do it? And they'll say, well, you have to be baptized to enter the Baptist church, but not to be saved. Okay. Remember all that language I said earlier in, you know, country boy, let me just back up a little bit like it buzz. Beep, beep. Hold on a minute. So I have to be immersed. I mean, I don't have to be immersed in water, but I do have to be immersed in water to be in the Baptist church, but not to be saved. Is that what you're saying? That's what the manual says. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, then that means I can be saved and not be in the Baptist church. If I have to be baptized to be in a Baptist church, but I don't have to be baptized to be saved, that means I can be saved without being in the Baptist church. So get rid of it. Get rid of it. Same way with the Lutheran and the Methodists and Episcopals and all of them. Let's just keep on going back all the way to New Testament Christianity. What about the Mormons? 
Galatians chapter 1, he says, if an angel comes and brings another gospel, they claim an angel came and brought another gospel. That's all I got to know. Not to mention 1 Timothy chapter 3, the, the young man who walk around the tag and says, elders, I sometimes ask him and say, hey, how's the wife doing? An elder must be the husband of one wife. They don't even have a girlfriend. 1 Timothy 3 means something. Titus chapter 1 means something. Many other doctrines could go into Jehovah's Witnesses. They'll teach uh, the idea of uh, annihilation, seven-day Adventists as well. They'll say, well, when we die, we're just annihilated. How can that be the case when the same word is used in Matthew 25, 46 for eternal life and everlasting punishment? If there is a cessation and there's no eternal punishment, there must be a cessation and no eternal life. You have to deal with that. And there's many other arguments against their false doctrine. They'll say, well, we, we believe in soul sleeping. When you, when you die, you're just kind of like asleep until, until judgment day. Well, that's not what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1. He said, for me to die is gain and to depart and to be with Christ. He didn't say anything about sleeping, soul sleeping. Seventh-day Adventists come along and worship on Saturday instead of on the Lord's Day on Sunday, and yet they haven't read Romans 7. Remember I talked about anticipation of error? Romans 7, 6, and 7. This is beautiful. Paul in Romans 7, 6, and 7 quotes one of the Ten Commandments. He said, I had not known covetousness, except the law had said, uh, lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. That's one of the Ten Commandments. And then in that same text, Romans 7, 1 and following, about verse 6 or 7, he says, but we've been delivered from the law. And he quoted one of the Ten Commandments. Well, then that would also include what other Ten Commandments? Keep the Sabbath holy. It's almost as if they've never read Nehemiah chapter 9 that shows you all of that was legislated at the Mount Sinai for, during the Jewish economy, and the point is they haven't. It just hurts my heart. And then we have brethren, some of these Johnny-come-lately youngsters out there, they're teaching this idea of a renovated earth. You know, that's been going around lately. They say, well, you know, maybe, maybe that's what it teaches. I'm talking about brethren who otherwise were sound. Well, you know, I mean, after all, I mean, it doesn't really say. What do you mean it doesn't say? Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He said the earth is his footstool and heaven is his throne. It says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus would enter into heaven itself for us. Friends, if we start taking the words of Scripture and cutting them up in our own minds to where we involve ourselves in denominationalism or liberalism or anteism, binding things we shouldn't bind, let me tell you something. We are no different than Jehoiakim in Jeremiah 36. But as for me and my house, and I hope for many of you, I want to serve the Lord. I don't want to do what he says. I don't want to cut it up. I don't want to burn it. I don't want to change it. Someone at this point says, Jason, we're mad at you because you said some things I don't want to hear. Come talk to me. I preach kind of hard, but I'm easy to talk to. I'm not going to jump on you and preach at you when we're talking individually, but I'm going to hold what the Bible, what the Bible says. Because you know what? At the end of the day, you're going, to, you're going to give an account of what this word says, same as I am. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath that which judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The words of my mind go to the book of Jeremiah. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 5, Woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. Put light for darkness and darkness for light. Isaiah 5, 20. Isaiah 8 and verse number 20. To the law and to the testimony. If any man speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in him. We can go to Psalm 119, 105. The word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Brethren, do we love the word of God or do we not? And I think the answer for most of us here tonight is we do. That's why we preach these things. We teach these things. We beg people to come out of false religion and denominationalism. We beg people not to add to the Word of God and go liberal, not to take away from the Word of God and bind things, things they shouldn't bind. So many wonderful things we could talk about. If you come back tomorrow night, I'll talk about a little bit more as we go to 1 Kings chapter 18, 17, and 18 and talk about standing up for the truth. I mean, this sermon wasn't even about standing up for the truth. Okay, it was. If you're here and you're not a Christian, can I just tell you how simple it is? Jesus said, except a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 3 to 5. He says a man must be born of water and of spirit. Huh, what does that mean, Jason? Does that mean that, you know, you're, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit? No, that's miraculous. Well, what does it mean then? How about let's let the Bible interpret the Bible. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, he there references the church being sanctified. And he says, here's how it happens. 
by the washing of water, by the word. So John 3, born of water and spirit, the church is sanctified. We add, we're added to the church when we're sanctified. That is, we have the washing of water by the word. How does the spirit work? Through the word. What does the spirit tell us to do? Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That's no different than 1 Corinthians 4.15 where it says we're begotten, same language. How? By the gospel. 1 Peter 1.23, where he says that um, we're begotten, not of, incorrupt, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So the Holy Spirit works through the word of God and teaches us that we're to be baptized for the remission of sins, which is exactly what Acts 2.38 says, which is exactly what Acts 22.16 says. It puts us into Christ. That was last night's lesson, Galatians 3 and Romans 6. The same thing they did in Acts 16, the jailer and his family, Lydia and her family. The same thing the eunuch did. He said, here's water. What does it hinder me to be baptized? He said, if you believe Jesus the Son of God, you may. They both went down into the water. He immersed him. They came up out of the water. And he went on his way rejoicing. No wonder then, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, that the like figure whereunto baptism doth now save us, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. You remember the devil's not in Genesis chapter 3? The devil said, Hath God said you shall not? He said you shall surely not die. Sounds a lot like 1 Peter 3. They say baptism doth not save us, the religious world. Peter says baptism, baptism doth now save us. They say he that believes and is not baptized is saved. But Jesus says, he that believes and is baptized is saved. Mark 16, 16. I've done enough, I hope. If you're not a child of God, don't you just want to be a Christian? It hurts my heart to think, Jason, are you, are you saying tonight that I don't have to be a member of any denomination with names and doctrines and creed? I can just be a Christian just like they were in the first century? That's exactly what I'm saying a member of the church of Christ, going to heaven, following the scriptures, following the pattern, growing, doing God's will. Is there anything wrong with that plea? The answer is no. Won't you come as we stand and we sing? You're not.